Welcome to Lesson 4 of our study of the Post-Exilic Prophets. Today's study will focus on Haggai, Chapter 2, Verses 1-9. through 9. Lesson 3 completed the first message that God had given to Haggai to deliver to the people. We called it a call to return to the work. They were called to re resume the building of the temple, work that had started and then stopped and laid dormant for quite some time. They had started the work shortly after their return from the exile in Babylon. They had worked diligently for two years and then were stopped by order of the king and did not resume that work until 14 years later when Haggai is called to deliver the, his first message. He speaks to the people and he speaks to the leaders. And we saw at the end of uh, lesson number three that they had a very positive response. They returned to the work heartily and, uh, and worked diligently. Today, our study today is, it comes from chapter 2. Chapter 2 as a whole records three messages that God delivers to the people through Haggai. The first message is to be found in verses 1 through 9, our study for today, and we could title it, A Call to Courage in God. Let's read the verses for today's lesson. Again, this is from the English Standard Version. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. The first message, while it was stirring and effective, may well have left the people feeling a little bit concerned. It had focused on the fact that their behavior had been a disappointment to God. The second message that we're looking at today will address some concerns the workers likely had and provide encouragement in their work, that, they, that their work simply not be out of fear of, of displeasing God, but out of the promise of joy in having pleased him. The first two verses introduce the message. Verse 1 provides a time frame for our message. It comes in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord comes by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. It's been nearly a month since the end of chapter 1. The work has been underway, motivated primarily by their fear of God at having disappointed him. We can often relate our relationship to God in the, in the terms of the relationship we have with our own parents or our relationship to our children. In that child-parent relationship, what are the two primary motivations? One is fear. It may be of disobeying or disappointing your parents. When we do that, we can anticipate discipline. The other motivation is pleasure. That comes from having pleased our parents by meeting or even exceeding their expectations for us in terms of what we've done or how we've behaved. Verse 2 tells us to whom the message is addressed. He says, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. He's identified as the governor. <clears throat> and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. But not just to them. It's also addressed to all the remnant of the people. So it's specifically addressed as a rabble, the civil leader, 
the governor, and Joshua, who is the spiritual leader or high priest, and then to all the people. Those all of the people being all those who have returned from captivity to carry out the work of rebuilding the temple. This message is not only for the leaders, and it's not only for the people, it's to everyone. The same collective group that was disciplined in chapter 1 are about to be encouraged in this second message. Is this old scripture uh, testament, uh, sorry, is this old scripture, old testament scripture, I will get that right eventually. Is this Old Testament scripture relevant to us today? It should be. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Even today, sinners are to be chastised or rebuked while they are caught up in their sin, but they're to be encouraged and supported when they repent and strive to do better. As Christians ourselves, we need to be disciplined when we are not trying and encouraged when we are trying. God encourages us through his word. We can encourage one another uh, through our fellowship. Verse 3 addresses a concern that many of them may have says, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? There were likely those among the people who had seen the original temple prior to its destruction, prior to being taken away in captivity to Babylon. How would they likely feel about the scope, the size of this new temple? It's much smaller than the original temple that Solomon had built. It will be much less ornate, not nearly as fancy. It will seem as though it's a mere shadow of the original temple, and they may see it as something as a disappointment compared to their image, their mental image of that original temple. Could this have led to grumblings during the work? Would it be hard to imagine that some would feel Why should they work so hard for something that was so inferior to what they previously had? The book of Ezra records the the reactions of those who were present when the foundations were laid 16 years earlier. From Ezra, chapter 3, verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. Who were those who shouted aloud for, loud for joy? Likely those who had never seen the old temple. They were filled with joy at the prospect of a new temple and a restored relationship with God. This was a time of excitement for them. They had never uh, witnessed or been part of the old temple. For those who had seen the old temple, the reaction was one of weeping at realizing that this new temple would not be nearly as impressive as the old one. And our study, I think, is going to show that their perception of this is very wrong. Uh, It wasn't about the size of the temple or how ornate the temple was. It was about the purpose of the temple and God dwelling among them. Verses 4 and 5 begin what is really the encouraging portion of this message. Let's read them. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. They're given three commands. The first is to be strong. The second is to work hard, work diligently. And the third is to fear not. 
Zerubbabel and Joshua are encouraged to be strong leaders. There were likely those who had said that they should stop the work on the temple, given that this new temple would be so much less, so inferior to the original temple. And God encourages them <clears throat> to remain steadfast in their leadership to complete the task. The people themselves are encouraged to remain strong in their commitment and in their dedication to the work at hand. They're told not to fear or to be discouraged might be a better way of understanding that because God was supporting their efforts. Consider the fact, how had God moved the Persian kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes? He moved their hearts in each case that the work that was to be done for rebuilding the temple would not only be permitted, but supported by the Persian kings, uh, both in terms of giving permission and providing financial support to its work. God reaffirms that he is with them. He had told them this in verse 13 of chapter 1. He was with them and reaffirms it here. He is supporting their work. In verse 5, God reminds him of, their pro of the promise that he made, the covenant that he had made with them when they had come out of Egypt. We can find an example of that in Exodus chapter 29, verses 42 through 46. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you there. Then I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So he had promised them, made this covenant with them many years ago, that the temple would be their means of communicating with him, that in a sense he would dwell in it in terms of uh, hearing what was done there, seeing what was done there, and taking pleasure in it. And that in, in exchange or, or as a result of this uh, relationship that they would have through the temple, that he would be with them, he would be supporting them emotionally. Let's continue with verses 6 through 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The people are, should take courage, knowing that God has a plan, and his plan involves the temple on which they're working. There are various interpretations of the meaning of this scripture. We're going to look at a few of those. Matthew Henry offers two suggestions in his commentary for the meaning. The first is that the shaking of the heavens and the earth occur as a result of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, leading to the idea that all nations will be shaken or transformed by the gospel. People from all nations will be part of this resulting church. They will fill the church with the treasures of their redeemed souls. And all things of true value, those being spiritual value, will belong to God. Henry's second suggestion considers that rather than the word treasures, we should think of the word desires as a better translation. What will be the genuine desire of all the nations? That would be a right relationship with God personified in Christ. Christ himself will be in this temple one day, filling it with his glory by his presence. Now we understand that temple will be greatly remodeled in the days of Christ. 
Uh, it will undergo a decades-long re uh, remodeling effort uh, that will be spearheaded by Herod. His attempt to bring the temple back to the glory that it enjoyed in the days of Solomon. A second interpretation comes from those who are uh, or subscribe to the idea of millennialism. Uh, those are those uh, that understanding, uh, taking from Revelation text, the idea that Christ will return to the earth and reign himself on the earth for a thousand years. They see the first fulfillment of this in Christ entering the temple and filling it with his glory during his ministry. They also see that Christ is that desire or treasure of all nations, but hold that the true fulfillment of this, this text is in the riches that the faithful will bring to the temple that will exist during the millennial reign. The shaking then in this understanding represents the destruction of the world, leaving only that which cannot be destroyed, that being the church. There are problems with this interpretation it is reliant on the fact, or the, the problem relies on the fact that the temple that is spoken of here will no longer exist during the supposed millennial reign. It was destroyed in AD 70. So it is difficult to understand how this could be fulfilled in this concept of the millennial temple. When we look at verse 8, the idea of the silver is mine, the gold is mine. The people working on the temple may well be concerned with the, the question, how will they provide for the materials of the temple? They're not, as we read in verse uh, chapter 1, rather, that they're, they're not terribly successful in terms of um, yielding great crops and so forth that would allow them to sell and, and generate um, money itself. So there may be a concern as to how they will provide for all of the materials that, that need to be um, acquired in order to build this temple. God reminds them that whatever they have in actuality belongs to him. They've been entrusted with it. And God is asking, will they use it in his service as they should? We can consider this same idea expressed in the parable of the talents that we find in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. The parable introduces us to three servants who were given sums of money to manage for the master while he was absent. Two of them had used the money wisely. They had earned more, while the third Fearing what would happen if he had lost money, simply hid it. When the master returns, he addresses each of them, praising the two who had invested and, and made use of the money and earned more, and, and chastising the one who had hid it uh, because he failed to use what the master had given him. That applies to each of us today. God gives each of us talents or abilities today for the purpose of furthering his kingdom. Do we as Christians make good use of those talents and abilities that he gives us? Or do we hide them in the ground like the servant who was disciplined or chastised for failing to use the tools that his master had given him? We should each strive to be like the first two taking the gifts that were given, those abilities, and using them to do our best to further the kingdom of God. Today's study is going to wrap up with verse 9, and it reads, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This new temple, as we've talked about, will not come close to the grandeur of the original in its physical sense. Though we must admit that one day Herod will improve on this temple that is being built greatly, nearly reaching the level of uh, um, physical impressiveness of the original temple. But what God is saying is that its spiritual effect will be even greater than the original as it will one day the, enjoy the presence of Christ in the flesh and the more perfect teaching that will come as a result of his ministry 
and the spread of his gospel. Some scholars speculate that Herod embarked on this temple remodeling I've mentioned in an attempt to fill this uh, prophecy in a very physical sense, pointing out that he didn't understand that it was meant in a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. God declares, in this place I will give peace, and indeed he will. He will give true peace, inner peace, the peace that comes through a relationship with Christ and hearing and understanding the gospel that's shared with us. Our next lesson will address the third message that Haggai is given to deliver. We might title it, A Call to Spiritual Cleanliness, and it's recorded in verses 10 through 19. I hope you find these studies beneficial. I hope we're each getting a greater understanding of God's word. And that's such an important aspect of us as Christians and, and our growth as Christians is to continue to study and grow in our understanding of the word. While we do continue to observe the stay-at-home order directors, we are looking forward to the time when we're going to be able to meet again in person to continue our studies and benefit from the fellowship that we enjoy when we gather together. To our members, I look forward to seeing you again as soon as we can. To those of you who are joining us and are not members, we invite you when, when the opportunity comes that we are able to join together again. We invite you to come to our services, come to our Bible studies, come to our worship services. If you have questions, we'd love the opportunity to answer them and address them. And again, we simply invite you to join us when you have an opportunity. We look forward to that time. Thank you, and we'll resume with Lesson 5. <music>